You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Each week, Cheryl will feature and discuss the many challenges of those living with disabilities, along with the various issues that are faced by their families that are caring for them. So now, please welcome the host of Courage to Overcome, Cheryl Jennings. Good evening. This is Cheryl Jennings, your host on Courage to Overcome. And I'm very happy to have you tune in tonight to listen a little bit to a discussion about special education and teachers. And also, I have a principal that will be on the line with us tonight. And as always, if you have a question or you have a comment that you would like to uh, enter, then all you need to do is to call in a toll-free number, and it's toll-free anywhere in the world. And the number is 8 Six six four five one one four five one, and I will give that number out again during the evening. But we're so glad that you've tuned in. This show tries to focus on how people can have courage, especially when they need to overcome challenges. And we've talked a lot about the challenges in the home and those who ha- are facing special needs, especially autism or some kind of a disability that makes the learning process is a little bit more challenging. We also have talked about having children with cerebral palsy or Down syndrome and other issues that can vary in the amount of problems that that child might have. And I also am so privileged to be able to have a teacher own who deals with severe and profound level of children because I have told you many times I have a son who has cerebral palsy and he falls into that realm because He needed everything done for him. And so I'm really interested in trying to find out what on the education level, what principals and teachers have discovered that really makes a difference in how the family will function along with the education process. And I know there are so many difficulties that arise and There are no two people that are the same. There are no two challenges that are the same. And so what we do is try to give some tips that if you are going through this, I want you to know, first of all, you're not alone. And by listening to some of the comments, maybe you can find something that would give you some little bits of wisdom or give you hope that if other people can go through the process, that you can too. And we realize that every community has got different kinds of services, so it's not a one package for all. This is simply a way of us being able to discuss some of the issues that would make the education process much easier by understanding from the teacher's point of view or from the principal's point of view what kind of things they've noticed that have been more helpful in families that have more success in helping educate their children. And when we are talking about special education teachers, I just want to mention a few things real quickly about some of the challenges that we find with special education. First of all, the teachers in special education have the highest amount of burnout. In fact, about 75% of those who teach in special ed will often leave their job within 10 years of starting. And that's because there is always this overwhelm and this need for more help and maybe too little is up from the budget to give them the help and the extra people that are needed to take care of children that need more than one person to help with a group. They face a lot of challenges that are hard for them because even the families don't often understand 
what the problems are that they're dealing with. There is a really big misconception out there that um, teaching is easy. And I can tell you firsthand, I know teaching is not easy. And it's not that I did it long term, but I did it as a substitute. And I also have so many friends and family members who are in the teaching profession and even teaching just children that don't have special needs has become more and more challenging through the year. So we want to recognize that. Also, special education teachers are expected to do many more things than a a teacher would for a regular classroom because they find themselves burdened with a lot of extra jobs that they didn't really know that they were going to deal with, maybe a lot more paperwork because each child has a different kind of problem and they have to treat it in a different way and they have to go to more meetings or talk to parents more often or they have Uh, challenges in helping with bathroom needs that a a different classroom might not have. Many times they don't have the support of the families or maybe they don't have the support of the people that are determining the salaries or, and we all know that budgets are always a problem. Sometimes the children themselves, and I know from my own experience that when a child has the emotional problem on top of that where they might just run away if they're not held on to or they will act out or scream or do things that they require more attention from a teacher than someone who would be in a wheelchair confined to a place and maybe not be causing any extra problem and I know when our son was in the years of what would be what would have been junior high Finally, a teacher told us that Blake had been overlooked a lot because he was quiet. He was very sweet to deal with, and he wasn't going to cause a disturbance, and he didn't require somebody to just talk to him all the time. But other children would have run away if they hadn't given more attention. And so that gave me a little bit of an eye-opener because that means that as a parent, we have to do much more in trying to support the teaching once that child comes back home. Sometimes you even, as a special ed teacher, you might have a a student that passes away because they're fragile in their uh, physical bodies. And sometimes you have to deal with that, but also helping other children understand it. There are also problems with including these children in a regular classroom as much as possible. And sometimes they require extra help and sometimes their level of need is so great that they cannot be included. And that's where parents have to be very understanding of their own child's needs and not push for more than they are. That's really reasonable for their child. But then again, they don't want to sit back and just say, well, whatever happens is okay either. Uh, Sometimes Teachers don't have the support of other teachers if they are dealing with special ed children because maybe other teachers might not even realize some of the issues that they're dealing with. So, But uh, most of all, I want to talk about the support of parents and whether or not that is a problem. And we want to look at that with some of the questions. And I'm going to start tonight with a principal that I know personally because I know her Heart is so good, and she has such a wonderful reputation in dealing with uh, the school as a whole. And she's going to give us a little bit of insight as to some of the issues that we might look at that would help families to know how can we be more supportive of schools, what are the things that she's noticed that the parents that are supportive, how much different it is for the child and their progress. So, Cindy, welcome to our program tonight. I'm very thankful to have you, and I appreciate you taking time to be on the program tonight. Well, thank you, Cheryl. It, it, it's an honor to be on the show, and um, thank you for the kind words that you said. Um, you, I think a lot of the things that you said were spot on. Um, I was sitting here shaking my head and writing notes thinking, absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that you said that really resonates home with me is that not two, no two people are the same. And um, I think that when, you know, we, we talked about individual education plans and you know, trying to educate that individual student. I think sometimes that it, it, you know, we get grouped into, you know, those are special needs students or these are regular ed students or these are whatever. And and I think that 
if we can take a chance to, you know, slow down just a little bit and recognize that each child is in, individually different and each child has specific needs. And as a parent, if you can help communicate c- communicate to the school, this is my child, these are my child's needs. It will it helps quite a bit. Right. Oh, that's that's great. I appreciate you making that comment. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, if you're interested in making a comment or asking a question, once again, the number is 866-451-1451. And during this break, if you get a piece of paper and a pencil, you might find that there's some notes that you might want to take and some hints on how to make this an easier process. We'll be back in just a moment. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Wait No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Wait No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Wait No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Wait No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Welcome back. And I just want to mention that I also have a teacher, Darla Smith, who is on here tonight with us also. And she works with the severe and the profound level of children with special needs. Welcome to the program, Darla. We're going to go back and forth with you and Cindy tonight. Thank you for having me. I am just excited to find out a little bit about some of the issues that you see that would be helpful if parents just understood whatever it is, you fill in the blank. If a parent only understood, what is it that would make the classroom situation go better for you and for for making it a better atmosphere for teaching their child? I would say if parents would understand the balance and you had mentioned it, you know, parents pushing, but then you don't want to sit back and do nothing And to understand that it is a balance that you have to work together as a team. And the only way to get to that balance is through communication, constant communication. Um, And for parents to understand, for the most part, special education teachers, we are there because we love your kids. I mean, we care about them. And you know them so much better, you know, when they come into our program, but we also get to know them so well in our classrooms. And so if we can keep an open line of communication and, you know, share what doctors have told you or share what you have found out, let us, you know, try it in the classroom. Let's see how we can work it together um, just to really get a nice balance for your student because that's what we're there for is it's not so much about fixing, but it's about making them the best person that they can be. And 
I know with my own parents in my own classroom, they call anytime. We talk. We let them know. They know me personally. And I guess to kind of understand that, that your teacher is a person and the majority of them have children. And so they care for them and they want want what's best for them just like their own children. And just to really keep those communication lines open and let's work together. That That's is something great. I would like to see. And I think, I, well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, though, and it's communicating more than just at the beginning of the year or the middle of the year, making sure that if they go to the doctor and they're told something, that they communicate that with you, or if a therapist changes something to let you know, or if there's a medication change. Um, those are things that are very yes. important. And do you have children that are actually on oxygen in your room or has that ever been something I, that you've had to deal I, with? I don't have this year and I haven't recently. In the past, I have had much more um, fragile students with health. Uh, you know, tube feedings and oxygen and suctioning and all those things. And so it is one of those that I really had to have an open communication with the parents for health reasons because their bodies worked differently. And so we needed to make sure we were on board and that, hey, I know I can call you at any time if I need something or that you can call me so we can share that. And I think another thing, especially when you talk about doctors and therapists and teachers and parents, no one person knows the answer to everything. And so that's why it's so helpful to share and discuss and talk and work together to make things happen because, you know, it takes a village to raise any child. And so especially for our kids with special needs, it's helpful. What is the most difficult problem? I'm sorry, go ahead. I I, I was just going to uh, add to that is that as, as parents, don't be afraid of the school. Don't be afraid of, of the principal. And, and uh, you know, always, if, if you feel like there's something you need to express, knock on our doors and make those phone calls and leave voice messages. And, and where we can develop, you know, the rapport with each other, you know, not and not just with the special needs teacher, with the principal, and then everyone understands and then everyone is working together as a team. And, and, and I agree exactly with what Darla said as far as that we're not trying to, you know, I don't think we can necessarily fix things, but just trying to do the very best we can for each child. Right. I think that's a great uh, suggestion there. And I think sometimes people don't realize that you've got children that you're caring for that have no bathroom control. And you have to deal with a lot of things that a different teacher would not ever have to deal with. And so that takes time. It also is something that learning if there's a certain word that would help a child tell you that they need to go or if there is anything that they require that's totally just a physical problem. Those are issues most people never stop to think about that you have to deal with. I know even as a family, people don't realize how many times, you know, that we tried and tried to have teach uh, potty training and people would look at us and go, well, have you ever thought about this? You know, until he was, he never was able to do that until he was 11 years old. That's a long time. But we worked all the time trying to figure out what would help him. And so, uh, you know, for Parents who don't have that issue to deal with, they don't understand how much harder it is for you as teachers and as a school to have to deal with those things. What are some of the other suggestions that you would have, Darla, that would maybe help a parent to just understand a little bit more what you would like for them to do? And would you like for them to be involved as a volunteer or is that really a hindrance or does it depend on the child? I would say it's going to depend on the child. Um, Typically, what I've seen is parent volunteers are great. And, I I mean, I've used parent volunteers. I mean, if any of my parents were listening right now, they would die laughing because I use them all the time. (laughs) I'm always calling them and being like, can you get this? Can you help me? You know, and and for me, my, my parents have been 
tremendous help for our classroom. And they do a lot of that busy work and side stuff that I don't have time for because, like you said, I'm working with a student that is a one-on-one or they need 100% help. You know, I'm not going to step away from this kid, but I've got all this, you know, copies that need to be made or errands that need to be run or I need someone to hit the store and pick up supplies so that we can do an experiment, you know, things like that. So uh, parents just being open. Um and willing to help, and if and there's some parents are like, well, I can't, I'm not crafty, or I can't do stuff like that in the classroom. Bring whatever you have to the table, okay? Because right. I promise you, we could use you in some fashion or form. I mean, I had one parent that just came up once a week and loaded potatoes from building to building because we used to sell baked potatoes. And that's all, I mean, he was there every Thursday wow. ready to load potatoes. And it was like, thank you. That's all, you know, because he, he wanted to help. Okay, I need somebody, I need some muscle. Help me with potatoes. Whatever you have. Um, some parents are good. I have another mom that she can contact a business and get donations like no other. Great. You know, it's not that they're just oh. working in my classroom, but they're helping my class. You know, it's not just a typical parent volunteer, I'm here for the parent party. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. So, again, open communication with the teacher. Tell them what your strengths are. See what they're doing. How can we build this program to include your kids, you know, more in the district or more in the community? I have parents that own um, a bakery, and, like, they donated a cash register to us to help us out with our school store. You know, so it's things like that. Like, let's think oh. for parents that can cook. They've come in and cooked and led, like, a cooking lesson for us. What are your strengths? And so, again, that's that whole communicate. Communicate with the teachers, and I promise you they'll be able to find something. Um, you know, I just had a dad deliver pumpkins to us today. Because guess what? He's out and about, and he's a farmer, and he found a good sale. Thank you, (laughs) you know? So (laughs) it just really seems communicating is the key for volunteering. It's the key for helping your students' academics. It's for helping their social skills. Get to know your kid's teacher, you know? I mean, really, get to know them. And, And, again, like someone had said earlier, don't be scared. We are humans, too, and I promise you we will make mistakes just like parents will. And when you have that good rapport, you guys can laugh about it later and be like, yeah, I really messed up. Okay, let's try again, you know, and just, you know, <laughs> it, it's almost like a big family, I guess, is the way I really try to get, like, my classroom to operate, and I couldn't have done it without the parents' support and the parents being willing to step in at any time or with whatever weird skill, talent we can come up with, you know? So That's great. Well, Cindy, what do you want to add to that? Well, um, just, just, you know, trust your teachers. And, and the better that you communicate, the better that you get to know them, then whenever a teacher, you know, wants your child to step outside of the box just a little bit, then, then trust that. And, we do, you know, have the best interest in mind, and so, you know, trust them. And then, you know, I, I too, always welcome volunteers. It's nice to see the different faces. And, and by the way, I'm very blessed to have Darla as one of my teachers. So, uh, but... Sounds like it. Volunteer, yes, volunteer, trust your teachers. Um, you know, if, as a parent, you know, we're... As you can tell, you know we're, we are very optimistic educators. Not not all educators are like that, and so as a parent, you know you do sometimes need to think about your gut. And if you don't think something's right, be at that school. And and what better way to be at the school than if you're volunteering and you're and you're seeing and and not not in a got you type perspective, but it'll help you understand what's going on. You know, oh, that makes sense now. I understand why Billy couldn't go to, you know, to the restroom at that certain time because Sally had to go at that time or, you know, but definitely right. just, I mean, if, and, uh, you know, 
be involved as much or as little as you can. And uh, one other thing that I think is kind of um, critical too is that when a lot of times, you know, we're we're fortunate in that uh, our severe profound teacher is, you know, she'll be with those students probably for four years. In some districts, that's not all the, always the case, and and with students who are not, you know, that that are not as you know, their disability is not as severe. So then every year they're going to have a new special ed teacher. I, I think it's really important every single year that as a parent that you, this is my child, this is my child's needs. I need you to understand this. Are are all of the teachers on board? And because I think sometimes it's sort of like, oh, yeah, he's gone to school there for everybody. Everybody knows him. Well, not necessarily. Right. Oh, those are some great points. I appreciate you doing that. Do you ever have any problem with uh, um, sometimes a parent thinks that their child needs to be included more in a regular classroom and the teachers don't feel that way? I, I, I think had that. How do you decide? Yeah. You go ahead. Go ahead, Darla. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I have seen that. and But, again, it goes back to that open communication. And, my, you know, my parents know that I'm laying it all out for them, and they're going to lay it all out for me. And it's a compromise. It's a working. It's, it's not me against you. It's these are the points or these are, you know, why I think this shouldn't happen or why I think it should and let's talk about it, and let's come up with, with what's best for the child because, again, it's not about I'm right, you're wrong, or that doctor is right, right. and I'm wrong. It's, what it's about is what's best for the child, taking into consideration the environment, taking into consideration the class, because, again, parents do need to understand, especially when it comes to wanting to um, in, decrease, like, the special education services or mainstream them more, the special ed teacher is going to have a good idea of the way the building operates. And they're going to have a good idea of, hey, that teacher may not work for your kid. And I'm just going to need you to sometimes go with me, you know, because if I'm here and, you know, your child, I want what's best for them. Sometimes I am going to need you to trust me that increasing that and putting them in that science class may not be the best bet. Let's try something different. But again, that's where that just total communication comes in, that I can talk to you as a person, I can talk to you as a mother, you know, a parent, and get you to see, hey, this is where we're working. You know, these are our goals that we've set. I understand you want them in the regular classes more. Let's try another avenue, you know, because I don't think this is going to work. So I just, again, it goes all back to communication. That's great. I want to mention uh, just right here that if people are interested in learning more or reading more about how they can be better at caring for their children or for a family member, I have a website called todayscaregiving.com, todayscaregiving.com. And I'm trying to get all of my sites connected to one place because I want it to be easy. I've got a site that if somebody is wanting to know what are the top 10 problems that families face when they have a special needs child, they can go to a page that they can just put their name in and download that. And it's called CherylJennings.com and it's C-H-E-R-Y-L. G-I-N-N-I-N-G-S dot com. That is just a PDF that I have made into a little ebook for you to download and be able to use. And the main thing is for you to know you're not alone, that whatever you feel as a parent or a caregiver, somebody else feels that way too. And the interesting thing is I went back to school as an adult back at Sam Houston State University, and I graduated in 1992. And I was asked to do a lot of work of, for a video about the communication problems that families face when they do have a, a special needs child. And I wrote a paper on parents are partners. And 
So many things that I've come across in the last few years have brought me right back to see that what I wrote about all those years ago, the things that I did on television were absolutely the same problems that we face today. We're no different. Our families face the same struggles. We have some of the same fears, some of the same emotions. It's just that we don't talk about these things in public very much. And that's why I am trying to make this show something where you can talk about the issues that you have as a parent, as a caregiver, so that you can know you're not alone. And that when you find that other people are able to succeed through this process, it can give you hope. Now, once again, the, the website that I'd like for you you to check out is called Today's Caregiving, and I will be getting more and more things connected to that so that you'll have a place where you can actually read some articles, keep up with things that are going on, and we'll constantly be updating you with books and information that is coming out. Uh, We're going to take another break, and when we come back, we will be interested to talk to Cindy and Darla again about some other things, so take a break, and we'll be back in just a moment. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interests through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Well, I am so glad that you're back with us. If you do have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, once again, the number to call in is 866-451-1451. And if you are a special ed teacher and you have a suggestion, please call in that number. It's 866 451 1 four five one and we're going to talk with Cindy just a little bit about some of the things that we have noticed that can happen and what we can do about it as parents and we're going to talk a little bit about the first thing is enabling and sometimes as parents we don't realize how we have maybe hindered our own child thinking that they can't do something and we've taught them to expect that they don't have to do everything. And I want to uh, to get the perspective from the school, from you as a principal, Cindy, on what are some things that you see happen and what can we do to maybe turn it around? So just take off and go with it a little bit. Okay. Well, I I am uh, aware of a situation where uh, a student you know, was on an individual education plan, and so the student brought home the the paper, and the back side was marked out. And uh, the mom asked, "Well, why is the back side marked out?" And the little the child respond responded, "Well, I go to to Miss So and So's class. I don't have to do the back side." Well, you know, um, 
And the response was, well, no, you need to try. You know, you need to go ahead and try that backside. And I, I think that, be, you know, not only, you know, as a as a parent, sometimes, you know, even any parent does too much for their children. Well, sometimes in the classroom, the teacher's like, oh, well, you know, that that's okay. That, that child doesn't have to do that when that child is special ed. Where I think, you know, knowing your child and knowing what you think that your child is capable of doing and pushing for that, and it may not, you know, it may be that uh, on Monday they do both sides and on Tuesday they don't do both sides, but keep pushing that boundary and keep extending that and and making them, you know, um, sometimes I think as parents it's easier just to say, oh, okay, well, well you know, if, if that's what the teacher thinks, then, then that's what's best. But I think as a parent, don't be afraid to say, well, no, I want, I want my child to do both sides. I don't want my child to be penalized because they tried that, but I want them to do both sides. Um, and then, that's you know, a good that kind point. Of Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, I, w- I was just going to say that would, you know, maybe lead us into the labeling type thing. Okay. Well, you know, and and Go I. Go ahead. Um, what do you think about the labels? Well, you kind of broke up on me just a little bit. Would you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. I just uh, was wondering what what about the labels that we put on children? Are they helpful or not? And what can we do that would make those labels not be predominant, and we see them as a child first and not a label? Um, I, I think that, you know, I think as we move forward in, in our education systems that, and that, that every child has an, an individual education plan and that every child has special needs and every child learns differently. And that kind of would, you know, relieve some of that, you know, and I, I have run into situations where I feel like a child would benefit from having special education services in place is more of as for protection than anything. But as a parent, the, ch- the parent is so afraid that, you know, my, my child, you know, I don't want my child labeled as special ed or, or where I think because of that label, stigmatism, the child, you know, I, I just kind of broke my heart because I felt like that the child is struggling and the child is having a lot of difficulty, but because of the parents' fear of the labeling, the child wasn't getting what they were needing. And um, I, I kind of see that a little bit in high school because I, I like for a child whenever, if they are needing special services when they graduate from high school, that those services are in place so when they do go to college, if they want to, or to a career tech that they can receive, you know, those services as well at college, because they may be able to make it at a lower level, but then at high, a higher level they may need more help. And if those if those programs aren't put in place while they're in school, they're very difficult to get put in place when they're out of school. So I, you know, it's it's well, the labeling okay. is listening to you. Listening to you talk about that. How do you get around that with a parent who does not understand? What are some things that we could suggest to parents? Uh, it, it, as far as I think that I, I think a lot of them just think that those services are just for here. That, you know that they don't. And the, it's the education and the communication of you know, teaching the parents that these are the resources that are available if your child does try to go to higher ed and. You know, I I'm, I think a lot of them think that, well, whenever a child graduates, that that just all goes away, and it doesn't. It, it, it continues with them. If, if, if it's so desired, you know, it's confidentiality, and no one's going to disclose that, and there's not ever going to be, uh, oh, here's your child's high school diploma, and it, it's asterisk, oh, special ed. Never. That's never on there. And so, you know, I, I kind of... I it, it I just think that it's important to have that protection there. If the child uses it, great. If not, it's okay. It's, it's you know it's that safety net that that is there. That's a really good point. And what about after a child is ready to graduate, but you know that they can't just fit into the regular job 
uh, situation, who do you suggest to parents or do you know who they could go to that they could actually get some help in getting them a job where it would fit what they're able to do? I know there are some well, resources out there that do that, but I, I think the Department of Re- Rehabilitation, uh, you know, that they, uh, while the, 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 you know, the child is at school, is part of, you know, when when we sit down and we do, you know, the IEP meetings, and that as they turn, I, I believe it's 16, then then those future career goals are put in place, and uh, that special ed teacher can help navigate those you know this is this is something that i think your child might be you know good at that that as a junior your child or or whatever age is in your state but they could go to a career tech and learn a skill or um but it's part of their their program as they lead to graduation is to have those you know potential employment skills but yeah i think the department of Re- rehabilitation is probably one of the a really good place to start I'm surprised sometimes that families don't know where to go for specific information. And I would just love to say, you know, it would be great if we had maybe some workshops for parents to go to. And maybe you have it with your school, but not all of them do. But to really just open their eyes to the different services that they might qualify for or they might want to check out. Just like uh, when our children are in maybe 10th and 11th grade, they start applying for scholarships for college. But if they're not going to be going to college to provide the parents uh, some of the suggestions of what their children can do on a limited basis and help them find a job for that. Because I do know that there are some services that that help them. And some of the companies like Walmart have been great at hiring people with some kind of a disability. And that just give them an opportunity to be of service, to feel useful, and to know that what they're doing is of value. And uh, I don't know, do you have anything like that with the school where you are? We we do some, and um, uh, Darla, she works with a lot of our students on some of those skills. She she referenced the baked baked potato, what she was, uh, what the students they had baked potato cells at lunchtime, and uh, it, you know the, the students would sell those, and they would prepare them, and then the funds that were produced were put back into special edu- the Special Olympics. Uh, right now, at lunchtime, we have uh, like a concession stand that our students they they run it, they manage it, they they uh, I, it's so sweet, you know they they start you know acting like they are at a hamburger place and, you know, I need a Frito pie up or whatever. And it's just really, really precious. But then, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, but the, the, the skills, you know, just, you know, as I said, you know, I, I feel very blessed to have a teacher like Darla that will do things like that, that she, that she steps out of the box. And, and my thinking is that if, if your school, the school that, you know, that our listeners, children, go to if they don't have something like that that might be something that could be brought to the administration and or or to the special needs teacher and say hey listen this other school has a concession stand at lunch that teaches them how to count money and it teaches them how to prepare food and is this something we could do and and take those ideas to the school so they can be incorporated um back right. to the the, yeah, the the idea of uh okay. of future Future jobs, uh, I think it, you know, do the, you know, job shadowing. If it's something, you know, that that you think your child likes, you know, set up a job shadow as a parent. You know, can my child come in and watch you do this job? And or, or mentoring, find a good mentor um, where the your child could go watch them and see. You know, is this something that you think that you know that you could do or capable of doing? And um, you know, I, I'm amazed always at the things that they're able to, you know, students are able to do. That sometimes people say, oh, they and can't I think do that. Well, but, and, right. And, but then, too, there are times that our children, when they are turned loose, can do things that will truly amaze the parents. 
they just haven't thought of working with them in that way. And I know when Blake was little, we had people that would visit our home and they taught me to wait. And he was very slow to respond. He did not communicate very much at all. And we were trying to help him. So they would say, make him say a whole sentence. I want chocolate milk. And sometimes at the beginning, it was like 10 or 15 minutes. It seemed like an hour or two. And it was hard. But as a parent, you have to allow them the time to do what they can do and not do it for them. We're going to take another break. And I'm so glad that we've been able to have this discussion tonight with um, one of our principals and a teacher to be able to open our eyes a little bit as parents, what we can do to help our children. We'll be back in just a moment and we'll have a little bit more. Psychologist, master certified coach and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm, True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi-day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Okay, this has been such a great conversation tonight, learning a little bit about the education process with special needs children and and how to improve it, improve the communication. And some of the things we've talked about is just learning that there's a balance, that we can't expect everything from the teacher or they can't expect everything from the parent, but somehow we need to communicate with each other about what is reasonable, what we can do to help them, How? because we're both working toward helping the child get to maturity and do the very best that they can. In spite of any kind of limitation, we might see many people are able to overcome challenges that are so much worse that if we can just encourage our children in any strength that we see, you never know what is going to open up. I remember when we got a call one time and we were told that our son was going to be honored at Texas A&M for his artwork. And I about fell off the bed when they said that. I said, what do you mean? I didn't even know that they were working with him with painting. And then I discovered that he was able to do artwork in a way with this art teacher at the, where he was in a residential situation. And Every painting that he did, she could mat it and frame it, and people wanted to buy it. And he actually decorated 14 Southern Dental Clinics in Houston. He has artwork at the University of Washington in Seattle at the medical school. And all over the place, there were people that would write in and say, I want these colors, and and he would do it. And it was just something that we were so happy with. And later, he was able to have his artwork actually in a museum, and he sold 40 paintings in one month and the museum was just about they just couldn't believe it they said they've never had anything like that to happen so I mean I wouldn't have known to even try that they were doing it 
not just for the art's sake, but to try to get the range of motion with his arms and giving him a different tool to use to paint with, which was a house paintbrush, he was able to make bigger strokes and a small one he could not have handled. But you think about the people that you've seen who have been paralyzed and they learn to do artwork with their mouth by holding a paintbrush in their mouth. We limit our own children sometimes and we need to just look for what are their skills? What are they stronger at instead of focusing always on their weakness? And I know you may have some things to say about that too, Cindy. I do want to say one more thing though. Tonight, I am today is is my first day to be able to say I've got two books that will be coming out that I'm a part of, and it's called In Her Shoes, From Perfection to Acceptance, and then the other one is In Her Shoes, A Stronger Version of Me. And in the books, there are several of us authors who described how did we go from feeling like we had to be perfect and then to learn to just accept ourselves and our good points and our weaknesses. And the other one is just how do we, how did I grow? How did I get stronger? And I can tell you, having a child with special needs has made me a stronger person. It's made me a stronger adult. And I've learned to love people in a greater way. I've also learned to trust people in a way that many people, Others maybe haven't, but if you would check out those books, they'll be coming out soon. And I have on Amazon right now my book that's called It Takes Courage to Be a Caregiver. And there will be more books coming out, more articles, and everything. So just keep in touch. You can always Google my name, Cheryl Jennings, and it's spelled with a G, G I N N I N G S. And I love being able to help connect people to services that are available. And when we find things that need to be changed, I love being able to say, let's work on this. Cindy, I would like to just give you a little time to just wind up here and tell us anything else that you have on your heart that would help us as parents in order to help the school, to help our children? I, I think, you know, sometimes, um, you know, when you receive a phone call from the school or, you know, uh, not to become defensive. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes when you get a phone call as a, as a mom, we go into the mama bear mode or dad, daddy bear mode. And, and you know, I think just, just pausing and not becoming defensive and listening trying to really help, you know, the the educator, you know, really get down to really what the fine issue is. Uh, you know, it, uh, a child may be acting out for a certain reason where, you know, the teacher is just reporting, you know, hey, I'm just calling to let you know that there's a situation at school today, everything is okay, and then immediately, sometimes the parent is, you know, well, what happened? You know, well, what, well, well, what? And I think sometimes just pausing, taking a deep breath, and listening, and having those open lines of communication as that were, that were discussed earlier. And uh, but, you know, but if you feel like there's a, a issue, there's a concern, always be at that school. Always have that, you know. Sometimes, you know, I, I would rather have a parent constantly calling me than have one that never called me. Right. I can agree with that because I know that if you aren't, are not in touch with the school for any reason, then there's more problems probably even at home. And that's another part of this, that we want to help families to stay connected to one another, stay connected to your children, and stay connected to all of the people that are servicing your child. And that's a lifetime job. Uh, our son is 47, and we are uh, just in the mode of getting ready for him to have to go through a surgery that we never wanted to happen. But We've made several trips to where he is to visit with doctors and surgeons and to find out what's going to be involved. And uh, Cindy, as you know, we're parents forever. You know, we, we just we will go to our deathbed as a parent. And so anything that the schools can do to help our children, we need to be in touch with them. But anything as a, a teacher, they need to be able to call us without feeling like they're going to be uh, chewed out for something that they don't deserve to. 
Right. And, what do you uh, find you know, is a? Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, and so sometimes, you know, as teachers, it's like I'm so afraid to communicate with that parent because if I tell them the wrong thing, you know, they're liable to sue me. Or, you know, if, if I if I don't right. handle this exactly the way it needs to be handled, oh, there might be a lawsuit where, you know, everyone is doing the best they can. And, you know, that's where if those lines of communication are open, oh, well, I'm, I'm comfortable for letting you know, letting that child extend their limits. I know that parent wants me to do that. That's a good point. And that makes me think of something that happened earlier for us. And that was when we moved from one place to another and we were asking the school for, you know, the bus and for physical therapy, occupational therapy and speech because he needed everything. And we had, we had, had not reached a point he could do without these things. And all the school could think of was the budget and how it was going to cost so much. And finally, you know, it was worked out because I actually went to the school, I mean, to the education department at the uh, superintendent's office and gave them the name and address of how to get those things done much cheaper from knowing where we had come from, from a different state. And, it all came about, it worked out, and then I went to the, went back to see the superintendent, and they were very reluctant to see me, and I said, well, I just wanted to tell him thank you, and all of a sudden, he said, come on in here, and when I <laughs> went into his office, he was like, what did you say, and I said, I just wanted to thank you for everything that you've done, and he said, would you write that, because nobody ever says thank you, <laughs> so as a parent, <laughs> be grateful for those people. And I know we're going to have to cut this off, but I do want you to tune in next week. I've got a great surprise for you and I enjoy being with you each week. Thank you so much, Cindy, for being with us and look forward to spending time with you next week on Courage to Overcome. You're listening to BBM Global Network and I am Cheryl Jennings, your host. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Be it Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or autism, listen each week for an informative look into the lives of those challenged by these and other disabilities today on the next episode of Cheryl Jennings' Courage to Overcome. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.